Now, my title, um, Who Wants to Be a Billionaire? Um, I thought it, I don't know why I thought of this title. Um, but uh, it, it did allow me to share my own journey uh, with you. And I'd like to start off by uh, reflecting with you uh, a stage in my life when I was just about your age. Um, I was probably about 21 or 22. And I felt quite conflicted about what I wanted to do. Um, and let me try and explain to you the two sources of conflict that I was grappling with uh, as a young man. Now, the first point I'd like to make is that when I was about 15 or 16, I was dragged um, on a very uh, interesting family holiday to a place that was of great spiritual significance uh, to my family. And I was a little bit bored uh, in the evening, and I got out a Bible. And I didn't read the Bible, I have to say, or well, not very much. And I thought, well, I am in a place of spiritual significance. Let me see what inspiration might come out of this book that I'm holding. And so I flicked the pages around, and I ran my fingers up and down a page, closed my eyes, and then I stopped. And I said, right, whatever it says is going to be meaningful to me. And you know, there's some pretty bad things in there, at least in the Old Testament. So, <laughs> and so, uh, of course, I went to the back of the book uh, to avoid that. But what it said is, all of the riches of the world shall be yours. That one simple sentence. And I thought, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty exciting, that's pretty good. I think that makes sense to me, I like this of that. And then I didn't think too much about it uh, after that. And then later on, when I was about your age, uh, I was at university, and uh, I was studying French language and literature. And one of the um, writers that we had to study was uh, a 19th century writer called Honoré de Balzac. And I have to say, he was a pretty boring writer, in fact, so much so that we used to call him Balzac instead of Balzac. <laughs> but his, his actual pronunciation was Balzac. And Balzac said, I mean, one of the most memorable things he said is, behind every great fortune, there lies a crime. And that was the other side of my conflict. I could see the future glittering there. And I thought, but hold on, there's something distasteful, isn't there, about making too much money? Um, and it made me think about how do you go about making money? And what responsibilities does making money and having money put on your shoulders as a, as a member of society? And these were the things that I debated um, as a young man. Now, I don't know if in this audience people have the same kind of a conflict. Um, you are, after all, the generation that made a number one hit song of that Travi McCoy and Bruno Mars song, I Want to Be a Billionaire So Freaking Bad. <laughs> so maybe you're all in the category that does want to be a billionaire. But I wouldn't mind doing a show of hands just to understand if there is any conflict in the room. So could I, by the way, I'm not going to single any of you out, so don't worry, this isn't going to lead you to being dragged up on stage or anything like that. But my first question is, in this room, who does want to be a billionaire? Is there anybody who wants to be a billionaire? Dr. Azahari, I am so proud to see you, Prof. You may have left it a bit late, but... Okay, now my next question is, is there anybody in the audience who does not want to be a billionaire? Excellent, I respect that. <laughs> and, but the remarkable fact is that the vast majority of the room did not put their hands up. And that means one of two things. Either you're very shy. Actually, one of three things. Either you're already a billionaire because you're a member of the Lucky Sperm Club. <laughs> if you're not a member of the Lucky Sperm Club, either you're very, very shy or you're ambivalent and you feel a conflict about it. And I suspect that that may be uh, the feeling that, that quite a lot of you had when you didn't quite find the wherewithal to, uh, to put your hands up. So in this room, let's just say that we have three categories. We've got the people who want to be money billionaires, we've got the people who don't want to be money billionaires, and we've got the ambivalent. They're not really sure, they're conflicted. And let's, let me try and address uh, each three of those categories, and hopefully you'll all know into which category uh, you fall. And the first one are the money billionaires, people who want to be a billionaire in money terms. Why do you want this? Well, because you want to change your life for yourself. You want to make a difference to your own life. You want to have great things in life. You want to avoid the drudgeries of life. You want great cars, great houses, own a football team. It's really shallow, but you can't help it. But there's nothing wrong with 
having that sort of sense of, of wanting to do it. Now, you may know what you want, but what you don't yet know is, how am I going to get there? And maybe that's why you're listening to my talk. How can I become a billionaire if I want to become a money billionaire? And there are, frankly, some characteristics of billionaires that I think are worth sharing, some behavioral types, some patterns, um, and a lot of research has gone into this. But it doesn't just happen by accident. It doesn't happen by serendipity. It doesn't happen by luck. Um, it doesn't happen by winning a lottery ticket. Uh, it's certainly not in ways that are accessible uh, to the people in this room. Um, but the common threads, which you can develop, because I can tell you when I was your age, I hadn't developed any of these things. But they came to me as I got a little bit older than you are now. So those years of finding yourself and finding your motivations are still in front of you. One of the key things, of course, is ambition. You have to be ambitious. Uh, no billionaire ever made a billion dollars by lacking ambition. You have to have a work ethic. You have to have a real work ethic. Nobody became a billionaire by lazing around. A work ethic where you have to sacrifice certain other pleasures. It might be family time, it might be you know, the inability to develop a hobby, but you must have that work ethic. And people often say, yes, but what about luck? Um, but I might just remind you of Sam Goldwyn, the very famous movie maker, who said, you know, the harder I work, the luckier I get. And I think that's the point. You make your own luck by hard work. The other characteristic, of course, is that a lot of people who do very, very well um, turn their passion <coughs> into their profession. So they become passionate about something. I think you could hear, Dr. Azari has just left the room, but you could hear that's a man who's passionate about Islamic finance. And it comes through. He loves it. And because he loves it and he dedicates himself to it, he will become truly, he may already be globally expert in this area about which he's very passionate. But if you can turn your passion into your profession, you are part way there to mastering in a rather unique um, and differentiated way something that many other people will not be able to uh, emulate. And as Confucius said, uh, if you choose as your job something that you love, then you will never work a day in your life. In other words, you enjoy it so much it doesn't even feel like work. And then two other points I'd like to make about the dollar billionaires. Um, one is that it's almost impossible to become a, a billionaire, a money billionaire, without taking some risk. Um, now, a lot of you at the moment probably contemplating a career as professionals, entering professional services of one form or another. It could be banking, it could be finance, it could be accounting, etc., etc. And actually, that is a great area to cut your teeth and develop your expertise and become truly distinctive uh, in your capability, whatever it may be, that going deep, not necessarily narrow, but deep uh, into what motivates you and moves you and being better at it than anybody else. The best place to do that is in a professional services firm of many different types. But at some point, and before you get trapped in that environment, you have to take the risk and step out and risk it all, maybe. Because without having that confidence, without getting out of that professional services environment, you may do very well, you will be very comfortable. You may all be millionaires by doing that, but you won't be billionaires. And then the final point I'd like to make to the, to the would-be dollar billionaires is you mustn't be afraid to fail. And I come from England, as you can probably tell from my accent, and one of the most unfortunate things about uh, Britain is that we have lost the ability to take a risk and be prepared to fail. In fact, if you were bankrupt in England, there is a great stigma against you. If you set up a business and it goes bust, there's a real stigma associated with that kind of failure, which is ridiculous, because that was just a lesson. And the next business you do, you'll do it better. And you might go bankrupt again, but the third time, maybe not. But the fourth time, you really will have learned so many valuable lessons that you may well then pull it off. And I use that to contrast with the attitude of Silicon Valley where if you haven't bankrupted a few businesses, you're barely worth talking to from a private equity or venture capital point of view, because you haven't kind of cut your teeth yet. So, and this is a, a quote that some of you may have heard from Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, the glory is not in never failing, uh, but it is rising every time you fall. And that resilience uh, is a real characteristic of 
becoming and being a money billionaire. Now, the other category of people who don't want to be billionaires, um, these are typically people, I don't know whether I'm speaking to the gentleman who asked the question earlier on and bravely put up his hand at that point, but these are very special people because they're not so much thinking about how they can change their own lives, they're thinking, how can I change and improve the lives of other people? And to my mind, those people are also billionaires. They're just billionaires in a different currency. And the currency is the love and esteem of tens of millions, of hundreds of millions, of billions of people, because their passion and their work ethic and their sacrifice and all of the characteristics that I described earlier on for the money billionaire, all of those things have been dedicated to improving the lives of other people. And there are many examples of such people around the world. The most recent and most poignant to me is Nelson Mandela, who died recently. But what a man. And truly a billionaire in the currency of love and esteem, because everybody who knows the story of Nelson Mandela, and now we're talking about billions and billions of people, if not the whole planet, have to say, we love that man, we respected that man for what he did, fighting against apartheid. So if that was your sentiment, then I salute it very, very strongly. And I would say, though, that the characteristics to become a great improver of other people's lives are very similar to the ones that it will take to become a dollar billionaire. So the, my earlier introduction is not lost on that category uh, of people. Far from it. And then the third category um, are those who are ambivalent, the people who didn't put up their hands because they're not really sure. And I have to say I find this maybe the most interesting group because I identify with you when I was a young man because I had that conflict uh, in me. And even today I feel conflicted. When I woke up this morning, I typically read the newspapers before I go into the office, and I saw a remarkable quote from Oxfam just as the Davos conference uh, is opening. Some of you may have read it this morning. If not, you'll probably see it because it's so quotable. But it highlighted the income and wealth inequality in the world. And it's extraordinary to me. And it's offensive to me. But the richest 85 people in the world have the same wealth as the poorest 3.5 billion people in the world. 85 people on one hand have the same wealth as the poorest 3.5 billion people on the planet. So when I look at that, I feel the conflict. Sure, I want to be in that 85 number, but I don't want to be in that number in a world where half of the rest of the planet, 3.5 million people, <coughs> in the aggregate can only add up to what I and 84 other people have. I find that disgusting. And that's, that's the conflict that uh, I used to wrestle with um, as a child. Now, let me tell you how I resolved that conflict. Um, so there I was at the University College London studying French language and literature. And I have to say, and I'm embarrassed to say it in this kind of forum, that I was a really pretty sorry student because that dilemma that I tried to describe there earlier on, the ethical dilemma, sort of eroded my work ethic and my ambition for a period of time. And in fact, the very fact that I chose French language and literature to study was a classic example of following the line of least resistance. So I did not, like many of my peers, say, what do I want to be? I want to be an engineer, so I'm going to study mechanical engineering. I said to myself, what is the easiest course I can possibly do? And because I happen to speak French fluently, I said, well, French, how hard can it be? I already speak it fluently because of circumstances in my childhood. And I must say I was a very embarrassed. I was an embarrassment as a student. I probably went to four hours of lectures a week. Four hours a week. And I do remember in my third year, it was a four-year course, in the third year, all of the students in the third year had to go out to France and either become teachers or to become students in one of the French universities. And this was a way of immersing us so that we really would learn French perfectly. We'd become fluent, totally fluent, by, by being immersed in that environment for a year. And I have to confess that I said to myself, well, where should I go? And I said, well, I think the south of France sounds quite nice. So I made arrangements um, to register with the University of Nice. And I stayed with a family friend. And I did go to the University of Nice, but I only went once to register. And I never went back for the whole year. And so when we, my fellow students and I regrouped for year four, 
know, I was saying to them, well, well, what did you do, and what did you do? And of course, many, most of them had been teaching to make a bit of money, but they'd had to do extra jobs uh, just to sort of keep themselves together. And so they said, oh, I worked at this, or I worked as a taxi driver. And they said, what did you do, Nick? And I said, well, frankly, I worked on my suntan. And they, they thought I was joking, but I wasn't. So I must say that experience didn't get me going. Um, but what did get me going was when I graduated from university, and fortunately in those days it wasn't continuous assessment. Um, it, was, it was all about your final year exams, and so I managed to work damn hard for two months, and actually I managed to graduate very well. Um, but I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. And what I, what, but one thing I did realize is I didn't want to go out and work. I didn't really want to work a 40-hour week or anything like that. I said, maybe I'll just keep going and join another university, do, do, a, do, a, do a, a postgraduate degree. And I was reading a society magazine, Harper's and Queen. My mother used to leave in the, the, the bathroom. <laughs> and it, there happened to be an, an article there, and it said, you know, the best business school in Europe is in Seattle. And I thought, well, there can be nothing wrong with going to the best business school in Europe. It's in France, after all. I can speak French. I was only 21 when I read this. I thought, well, I don't see why I can't get in there. Now, of course, it's practically impossible to get in straight out of the university. And for some reason that I can only try, uh, attribute to divine intervention, honestly, I got in. And I went there at the age of 22. Now, I hadn't still quite developed my work ethic, but it was there that it suddenly hit me about what life was all about. Because first of all, I was surrounded by many brilliant people. My fellow students were all ex-McKinsey, ex-Goldman Sachs, economists, and so on. Really great people. That wasn't quite what triggered the work ethic, actually. What really triggered it was the sudden, shocking realization that the grading system at INSEAD was not absolute, it was relative. And so what that meant is if, for example, I was doing an economics exam, and let's say I got 91%. Now, in absolute terms, you'd all agree, that's pretty good. But if everybody else in the school got 92% or more, I came bottom, and I got the lowest grade, <laughs> which would be a 1, <laughs> grade being a 4. And it, worked, it turned out that the bottom 16% in every exam would only get a score of 1 for that particular subject. So I thought, wow, this is quite tough. And then the real shocker was when it was revealed to me that if your average drops below 2, you get kicked out. <laughs> so then, I, did, I, I sat down with a Facebook. And by the way, this wasn't the Facebook that you know today. This was a real Facebook, which in those days was a book, a physical book, with a photograph of every student with their, under, their qualifications, what job they'd done before they joined, joined in Seattle, all one page, right? And I thought, crikey, I, I better, I'm going to look through this book and see if there's anybody here I can beat, you know, logically. And so I went through a page after page, so and so and so and so, three years at Goldman Sachs, you know, Masters of Engineering at Cambridge. So I said, okay, I'm not going to beat him. And I went through the book, and I went through the book, and I went through the book, 150 students. And there was one student that I thought I might have a chance of beating, but I wasn't sure. And it was a lady who was a journalist. But then when I read in a bit more detail, I said she was a business journalist. So even then I thought, okay, I'm really coming bottom. I'm not just in the bottom 16%, I'm in the bottom 1%. In fact, I'm less than 1%. And I thought, I'm going to get kicked out. And that was the epiphany, because from then on, Okay, I really have got to make this work. And I studied, and I studied, and I studied, and I developed my work ethic, and we had exams every six weeks, and I shocked myself by doing really well. And it was at INSEAD that I realized that there are moments in life when you're, that life allows you, or your circumstances, or your university, or how well you do, allows you to get onto an escalator of professional success. And at INSEAD, it was great, because you didn't have to apply to anybody. They all came to see you. McKinsey would write to you and say, I'd like to interview you. Goldman Sachs, Bain, Boston Consulting Group, and so on. And from a very unlikely starting point, you know, two or three years before, I just about managed to get my fingertips onto the escalator. And I joined initially Bain Company, and then the Boston Consulting Group. And I loved that firm. It was the formative experience that made me what I am today. And after a couple of years, I got that sense of adventure. And I thought, you know, I'm having a great career here in Europe. I'm based in London. I love London. I'm from London. But there's a whole world out there. And I'm still only 24. So why don't I go out to Asia? 
because the Boston Consulting Group in those days wanted to expand its presence uh, in Asia from a pretty much a zero start, so they were kind of looking for volunteers. And I said, why not? And that was in 1988. Uh, and I came out here, uh, and I actually not really wanting to tell you my life story particularly, I want to draw out of this certain elements that I think are important. But everything just happened quite naturally. I, I had fantastic clients all over, the, all over Asia. Here in Malaysia, <coughs> some of the best companies, Petronas, NBS, Bank of Commerce, that became CIB, fantastic clients, but all over Asia. I was lucky enough to be the youngest partner in the Boston Consulting Group worldwide when I was made a partner. And then, at the age of 36, I thought, I think I've mastered what it is to be a consultant. I think I've mastered the way of understanding how to maximize shareholder value, how to take a company and build on its competitive advantage to make that company much more valuable over a period of years than it was earlier on. And I thought, I have really developed very valuable expertise, very rare expertise, about how to grow companies, how to make them much more profitable, how to make them much more successful. So I had developed that sort of rare and distinctive capability that I was describing earlier on. And that's when I decided that um, I would set up Navis, a private equity firm. And I did it with two very dear friends of mine, also from the Boston Consulting Group. And we picked Carla Umbra as our headquarters, as a matter of fact. And we started quite small. We just pulled together as much money as we could get from ourselves, from our family and friends. We had 67 million US dollars. And I don't know whether we were lucky, but we certainly worked really, really hard uh, to echo Sam Goldman. And we bought companies for $10 million. And a few years later, we sold them for $80 million. And then another one we paid $15 million for, which we sold for $120 million. And then a bit later on, there was one here in Battle Caves, Linusex. We bought it for $34 million. We sold it for $200 million a few years later. King Safety Shoes, Singapore listed company. We took it private for $64 million. We sold it for $400 million. And suddenly, that little $67 million has today become $5 billion over a 15-year over period. So that has been a little bit about my journey. And the reason I wanted to, 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 to explain this to you, particularly in the category when I'm addressing the, the people who are more ambivalent in this room, is it's not too late for you, right? Because I was a bit older than you when I was going through this kind of dilemma, and I hadn't found my work ethic, I certainly hadn't decided to study something as you know, difficult as, as business and finance and accounting and so on. I'd gone for the easy route. So it's not too late for you to find that work ethic, to find that area of professional expertise that is where you go deep because you love it, where, where you become distinctive. And it's certainly far from too late to become an entrepreneur. You've got plenty of time to become an entrepreneur. And then, God willing, if you succeed, you will then be able to change gears and achieve what I think every ambivalent person in this room wants to achieve, which is when you've made many millions or billions and you can, you've already improved your own life, you can then turn your attention to improving the lives of others. That is the beauty of being in the ambivalent category. And there's no better example of this than, I would say, Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, who together, have, uh, amongst others, have funded the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is truly exceptional. Um, just their work in you know, the child vaccination programs around the world is extraordinary. They're, they funded the research that has gone into perfecting the vaccine for malaria. And malaria is truly a terrible thing, right? It affects 200 million people a year, and about just under a million people just under a million people a year die from malaria. And so if you think about a money billionaire like Bill Gates, I think by now you'd agree that he's also a billionaire in the other category of love and esteem for what he's achieved. And then the final piece, I've just been told I've only got five minutes to go. The, the final piece uh, that I wanted to address to all of you, whether you're going for the money billionaire or the you know, changing lives of billions of other people for the better, or you're in the category in between. There are three things that I think are common threads um, that I'd like to highlight. But the first one, which Dr. Azahari also uh, mentioned, is morality and integrity. There is, there's no room for making money uh, through lack of integrity, through lack of integrity, through crime. So whatever you do, you have to have a strong moral compass and always conduct yourself with a sense of integrity. Am I doing the right thing? for my firm, am I doing the right thing for my customers, uh, etc. 
The second thing is, um, for me personally, it was always very important that I had a continuous connection with God. And personally, I have prayed in churches, I've prayed in cathedrals, I've been to Mecca, and I've prayed there, I've prayed in Buddhist temples. Um, and I never asked for silly, selfish stuff. I didn't say, oh, I want to you know, find a pot of gold. I asked for very important things that were really of existential importance to me. And I got them all. I got them all. Um, and so that little bit of inspiration and divine intervention, I think, was certainly something that I have benefited from. And then the final strand is to say that on this journey, as you go through it, I think it's really important that you always not only maintain a connection with God, but you maintain a connection with humanity, and you care about humanity. Uh, because the human condition on average is very, very unfortunate. Um, and so if you can conduct yourself with integrity, if you can ask for God's blessings, and you receive God's blessings, and then having got those blessings, you share them with the less fortunate, then somehow there is a connectedness between all of those three things, which I think will hopefully allow you to thrive and be very, very proud of what you've achieved uh, over the rest of the course of your, of your lives. And on that note, I'm going to stop and uh, take questions. Thank you very much.